Hello and welcome to another very special episode of the Sales Off Demystified podcast. Today, we're joined by Yuri Dekiba, who interestingly has been in and out of the Sales Off world recently as she stepped into research and also notably is part of the Vidyard Mafia. As the listeners of the show know, we probably had about four ex-Vidyard people on the show, all of which are great. So I'm sure Yuri is also going to be great. Yuri, welcome to the show. Thank you. So let's kick things off. Um, I know you've been in business operations and sales ops for a while, but could you share how you first kind of got into the field? Sure. Um, uh, my career, I would say, in sales ops, you could go back to started um, really in inside sales. So I actually started out at um, probably what would be considered the entry level point as a sales associate way back when at Symantec. And from there, for various reasons, I've always been um, passionate about just learning and continual development and interest since I was young to become a teacher, which led to my interest back then in uh that what was called sales training, now more commonly known as sales enablement. I would say that was really my foray into from sales into a portion of what you could consider operations, but started out in the sales training enablement world. From there, um, when we were rolling out a methodology for opportunity management and improving sales process, naturally with that comes some project management aspect that you need to you know, be able to have. And so moved into project management and eventually into sales operations of various roles. Got it. So we're combining well, being in sales with an interest in teaching and an interest in project management. And if you do actually think about it, when you combine those, you do come out with something related to sales operations. So that yes. makes total sense. Mm-hmm. Um, then could you share your rationale? Because I know you your role at Akamai Technologies started relatively recently, and before that you were in research. Yeah. Um, what tempted you to step out of day-to-day ops into research and then also back again? Yeah, very good point. Um, My career has been about 16, 17 years at larger companies like Symantec and Veritas, so quite stable, and I really progressed into various sales ops-related roles throughout those years. And then after that, I took, uh, I made a personal decision as well. I've always been interested in kind of being more hands-on involved in a growth mode or startup type company. And so that was my first jump into the other extreme, you could say, from a kind of an enterprise to a smaller organization. And my entry point into that world was Vidyard that you mentioned earlier. And from there, I had a couple of years where I was able to engage in smaller companies, both Vidyard and another company uh, called Docutech for FinTech. Um, So still stayed in the high tech area, but more of a smaller organization with more hands on. So after that, I started to recognize that I'd actually like a little bit more stability, you know, as with smaller companies, there's a lot of changes that happen. And this research company happened to come my way when I started looking, it was either continue in operations in a larger company back again, or potentially research. And I think my interest in training and the learning and sharing what I learned throughout, you know, even my from childhood into my career really perked my interest. I wouldn't have considered it until somebody reached out about this opportunity. And I had the opportunity to work in the research area at CSO Insights. And that was a phenomenal experience working side by side with Tamara Schenk, who's a well-known figure in sales enablement. Um, And with that now at Akamai, I have truly benefited from the research aspect of my um, professional career in that I really understand the best practices and how I can execute against that best practice. It's always hard to balance, you know, research best practice with the day-to-day and executing against it. But in the current role, I'm able to really balance that view and determine when I should really stay with that vision um, from a best practice perspective and figure out how to execute against this. So it's been an invaluable experience. Got it. Sure. And so can I ask you then about what you foresee happening in the sales ops or the core trend that you were thinking about during your time in research over the next one or two years for sales ops? Yeah, very good question. I think um, my answer if I were in the research role last year and now back in doing operations, plus the current environment with the coronavirus situation, 
it's going to be different, obviously. Um, last year, I, I think, and even right now, the big focus, as you are familiar to probably, Tom, is uh, the word and the terminology revenue operations, where sales operations is a component of. Um, and I would say that trend will probably still continue, my personal perspective, taking my research hat off for a second, uh, because there just is that need for marketing ops, sales ops, and customer success related operations teams to work together because that really is the overall end-to-end -end customer experience and engagement with any business or organization. From the point you see something from marketing into engaging with sales, whether online or with a person, and you're experienced after you purchase something. So I don't think that's going to go away. Whether it's an org structure um, you know, alignment or more of a collaboration across different functional ops teams, I think that is still going to be, uh, a need will be there. And the more, the stronger the alignment, the better it is going to be for the company as well as the customer experience that the company can deliver. Now in the coronavirus situation, I think what's important is for, um, I'm going to kind of hone in on sales operations function for just a second um, back again, is the ability for us to be able to pivot to support the business in times like this where majority, if not all of your sales teams, you know, are now going virtual. And what does that mean? And the ability to really be agile, to be able to meet the changing business needs will be key for sales operations. But as anybody in sales operations knows, what is unique about sales operations is there is a constant day-to-day -day operational aspect to support the sales organization and the business that you just have to be able to maintain a bare minimum, right? Uh, including things like sales comp, making sure sales gets paid correctly and that their compensation plan is aligned. At the same time as the ability to support strategic projects that align to the priorities coming from top down. Now, at the same time, coronavirus is another angle, another dimension where you're trying to manage both from top down to you know, the bare basics and something else coming in the middle. And the ability to really take a hard look at what do we focus on and what do we stop doing um, that is something I think sales operations really need to be able to do more quickly than possibly usually. Uh, the balance of strategic and the day-to-day -day itself is already challenging. And this is something that when I was in the research role, we continually heard in our survey results is the prioritization, right? How do you balance that? Especially if you are a younger sales operations team or a mature one that's trying to go to that next level as an organization. Um, you still have to figure out how do we manage and maintain that balance. Now with coronavirus, there's so many things such as are there new metrics we should be looking at that might be more activity focused or are there new positionings for the solutions that the sales teams need to be going after? How does that change the dynamic of the forecast that we're looking at? Um, you know, whether it's a focus on new versus renewal. As the company shifts, you know, more in a fast-paced manner in a situation like today, I think sales ops also needs to have the ab ability to be, for lack of a better word, agile and nimble so that you can support those incoming new items as well. Cool. Yes, there we go. Um, that was actually going to be a later question in this interview about how the virus is potentially impacting your sales strategy. Um, but before that, um, could you share something that you've done since joining Akamai that has impacted productivity of the reps? Yeah, good question. Um, for Akamai specifically, without going into too much detail, um, we actually introduced a new metric this year. And that, um, I would say, has really shifted kind of some of the metrics that we're looking at. And I won't go into too much detail. and. What I would say coming in, because I came in at the trail end of the planning cycle uh, since I joined in January, so it was already kind of an execution mode. So I was not part of the initial discussion for the introduction of this new metric. But having said that, uh, what I can see is that has significantly shifted the focus of the sales teams compared to what I hear was happening last year from a productivity perspective as well. And you know, in a high level summary, what the new metric did was align more closely to the 
leadership level expectation. So let's say there's like a plan that, you know, we are aligned against as an organization. Uh, but if your metric, in, you know, tied to quota and comp plan are not matching exactly to what the leadership is looking at from an operating plan perspective, there's always going to be a disconnect. I think, you know, many organizations go through that. In this scenario, it's one of those examples where there is more alignment towards what the executives are looking at from an operating plan perspective and what we're asking the reps to do. And that, you know, even though it's already been a few months since I joined, we have seen some shift in that because, of course, that drives the aligned focus of the sales team in alignment with where the leadership is looking at. Um, it seems like it's a no-brainer, but I've mm. seen other organizations that kind of have that gap, you yeah. know, where the reps might be focusing, um, you know, based on... Uh, you know, a lot of times you hear comp drives behavior. It is very true, but it's also the quota aspect of it, not just the comp. It goes hand, you know, side by side. And so having that alignment during the go-to-market planning se- section of the, your planning cycle is very key because it does make a big difference. And I'm already seeing some of that based on what I understand from last year. Yeah, I was going to say, it sounds pretty... Um, what's the word? Simple that that's what you should have, alignment between what the actual kind of business wants and what the reps are aiming for. Um, So that makes total sense. Um, Cool. And then moving on to the forecasting process, is there, like, are you guys directly involved in how that works or like how does that process work with you? Uh, You mean sales ops is directly involved in the forecast process? Yeah. Yes, definitely. That's one of our I would say that's one of our major functional areas in providing support for the forecast process. Um, And really, right, the sales leaders should own the forecast process uh, because then that really leads to holding the teams down to the frontline level, being held accountable. If this is what you're saying you're going to commit to, then is that what we see consistently? And so that is something that we have rolled out and are doing. Um, and we not only pull the reports, uh, we use tools that help us with getting line of sight into that, you know, in addition to our CRM, but we support the leaders that we have. So I support at the division level, my team supports at the geo and functional level leadership. And all of those support then funnel up to the division level forecast calls that I help facilitate. But again, we're simply a facilitation mechanism, but the leadership should own the forecast discussion. And what the function that we try to provide as an operations team is providing some of that consistency in what are the discussion points, the process for the forecast, as well as um, the tools that we use from a dashboard perspective. That's really foundational is that's what we need to do on the back end so that the leaders can have the discussion that they own during the forecast reviews. The other piece that's also important that my team and I have been discussing quite heavily recently is the fundamentals of op hygiene in salesforce.com or data hygiene, you could say. Um, Because as you probably know, if we're looking at dashboards and the forecast is rolled up and managed via CRM and other tools of support, you know, sit on CRM to provide that visibility, it's really only as good as the data that is maintained in salesforce.com if that is the source of truth we have. And so making sure at the frontline rep level that they are inputting the data and uh, all of the opportunity hygiene cadence that we have in place is taking place, that is critical. And uh, we have quite a uh, mature cadence process in place. Um, And what we're now working on is more of a stand globally consistent cadence. Every group does it, which is great. And I would say 85% is consistent. But it's more, you know, now that we're looking at it at a division level, let's make sure some of them are a little bit more consistent so that all of what really ultimately feeds into the divisional view um, that the geos and functions, you know, report into is really kind of consistent. And technically, you can ideally say it's cascaded, right? Bottoms up, funnels up into the division level. So. Got it. So, so what I'm essentially hearing is you guys are responsible for making sure that the information that leadership are discussing is as accurate as it can possibly be, both through the forecasting process, but also through the underlying information. 
Yep. And I would say, as with any organization, that's a challenge, right? That's a constant ongoing challenge. Uh, data hygiene is something that, again, sounds very simple when you talk about it and fundamental, but uh, every organization, you know, has something that they need to be working on, um, you know, whether it's a rep input um, you know, best practice, cadence, or uh, duplication of data, right? So those are things that just have to be managed as a key part of what I would consider the sales foundation that the sales operations team really are the keepers of so that the sales teams can be effective and the sales leaders can really have those discussions that help them make the key decisions. Um, going back to these, the virus and these challenging times, has that like has that changed how you guys are working with your sales team and is, has it also changed about things that you were planning for the rest of this year and maybe next year yeah um so we go by calendar year so you know we just finished our first quarter and i would say it has but um it's kind of the we're at a point of well, what do we pull the trigger on i think you know it's one of those things where there are some things that you can actually shift and pivot and execute it against right away, such as um, really focusing in on particular products that have a, a business case uh, to address some of the needs as a result to the coronavirus impact, such as, um, uh, you know, we're in the internet traffic, right, environment. That's our business. So how do you more people are working remote, which means you need to have that internet traffic capacity, but it's not an office situation. It's more of the how do you provide that remote access capability without too much of a fluctuation, right? Unlike when you're going into an office and you have a dependent network. So those are some of the solutions that we do offer. So kind of really being able to focus on that and creating some programs around that, as with, I'm sure, any other companies that have a value add to address the current situation with coronavirus impact. Um, and focusing in on that at the same time, uh, it's more, you know, I've also heard some other organizations, you know, when I've joined some forums, uh, talk about kind of the monitoring mode. We're not, not doing anything, but we are keeping an eye out on it. But let's be conscious of when and how we make the decisions. So you don't want to pull the trigger too early on things that could impact the team. But I would say one of the core things from an operations perspective we are keeping an eye out on is what is the impact to sales, um, you know, even from a compensation perspective. There's obviously going to be an impact. So how do we address that in a way that makes sense while also kind of making sure that we still have the you know, business that we're supporting? So I think it's a fine balance of, you know, we're very much aligned with the leadership. There's, as with any other companies, I think there's constant communication and discussion going, and we just need to be able to be on top of that so that our organization is trying to think ahead from an ops perspective, understanding where leadership discussions are and saying, well, if this is a concern, let's think it through. Is it really a concern? Should we monitor it? If not, let's make sure we have line of sight into it now so that we can decide proactively, maybe this is something we should do something about. So we're already brainstorming, but with the context of, doesn't necessarily mean we have to take action on that, but at least we have some options for the leadership to kind of select when they ask us to do something and we're responsible for executing whatever that plan is that they would ask us to do. Got it. Sure. Um, now I'm going to put you on the spot. If there was only one sales related metric that you can measure for the rest of your career, which would you choose? Oh, <laughs> that's a very good question. Um, and just, just to clarify, Tom, was that sales-related metric? Is that what you said? Yes. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, let me just think for just a second. Um, I think one metric is a really hard one. Um, probably... I don't know if I can cheat here a little bit, Tom, but I think a, a key component with whatever metric you look at is not just the current state or current quarter or even current year, but being able to compare historicals year over year. Um, so whenever you set up a baseline, so I'm kind of cheating here in that I'm not answering that one metric piece uh, because I think it also depends on every organization. Um, 
one thing that comes top of mind that we also focus on as well is kind of, you know, uh, sales productivity as an example, because that gives you kind of a sense of, you know, based on what we're targeting towards and quite frankly, the number of reps we have, it shows you, you know, where your productivity level is as an organization. So if we had to choose anything, maybe that might be one. But what's important there, regardless of which metric it is, is being able to compare whether it's year over year or, you know, multiple years. Um, Otherwise, it's a metric that you have but it's limited to just the current state or current year. And when you have the ability to compare, yes, year over year, there's different impacts, you know, different things that can impact where your numbers are, but you have something to compare to see, are, am I good or bad? And a comparison point, a baseline to compare against. And with various reasons, you could say, well, last year we did this here in this quarter, compared to that, we're here, Is that good or bad considering some of the other impacts like coronavirus right now? So having that point of view historically is very important. Again, that goes back to, however, the ability to pull good historical data you can rely on goes ultimately back to uh, data hygiene. Uh, Because if, let's say, your reps are reusing an old opportunity time and time again, uh, and creating new opportunities. So you can imagine that opportunity in Salesforce or you know whatever CRM you're using is going to look like it has a 200 day, 300 day plus um, you know opportunity kind of age. Which if they're simply reusing it, then that is something you have to be able to take out of. It just skews your historical data significantly as well. So I think it ultimately goes back to data hygiene is very foundational, and every organization has this challenge. So. That's a nice perspective on the metric question. We haven't had that before. Um, And then finally, who in your career has educated or inspired you the most um, in sales operations? Yeah, very good question. I have a couple of people, but I would have to say, um, and this is kind of a shout out to my one of my previous bosses uh, would be Bill DeLacy. Uh, he, uh, I was his uh, business ops lead or so-called chief of staff, you could say, uh, when I worked with him at Symantec, and he was the global SVP of both sales and marketing operations. And um, I mentioned him, and he really was truly a mentor for him as well. Uh, what I admired and learned from him a lot that I'm trying to apply now in my current role as well over the years is his ability to be very strategic. In operations, a lot of times, and especially if you're in a smaller company too, it's a very, you know, execution focused role. And yes, that is what we should be doing. But what I learned significantly from Bill is uh, looking at it more wider, more holistically, maybe even above and beyond than what you would think ops would be. Um, And being able to have that strategic view for a function like operations, have learned so much from him. Uh, in that everything we do actually is strategic, right? It's not just about executing against a plan. Uh, take sales compensation as an example. It's a very common function in operations, you know, partner very closely with the finance teams, but you can get very tactical, right? What is the plan? What is the comp structure? What is the sales role? When you interpret how do you make that strategic, which I also learned from leaders like Bill, is, well, there should be the go-to-market strategy of the organization. Then there is a coverage aligned to drive, you know, execution against the go-to-market strategy, whatever those are. Then there's a sales roles that support that coverage and alignment. Then the territory alignment there. Then there is the compensation structure that supports the sales role. And, of course, the quota that ties to compensation as well. And, those are more sequential, but to me, I think that's an example of you can see the how all the thing the pieces fit together, ultimately tied to a very strategic area, which is go-to-market strategy that the leaders decide, right, based on the organizational operating plan and where we're headed for the next few years. Um, and so the ability to up-level sales operations in that way is um, challenging, I would say, right, in that ops tends to be so focused on execution. But we have a need to do that because otherwise, we should be the thought leaders to provide the leaders with the perspective of if that is your go-to-market strategy, this is how you can execute against that strategy. And we shouldn't just focus on execution, but also helping provide a blueprint to the leaders of, okay, this is all the things that the mechanisms that need to work in place so that our teams can execute against that plan. 
And I think that is a different way to engage with the leadership that positions sales operations as a more strategic business partner. Cool. And so that was all from Bill. The ex- uh, majority, on. yes. I majority. learned quite a bit from him. Um, you know, he's much more senior than him, has much more experienced, but I learned so much in that capacity because he was such a strategic thought leader. And from there, then I would, you know, I mean, going into the research world, that even further added kind of that best practice perspective and how actually, yes, best practice can be applied in a very uh, tactical oriented, you know, situation operations as well. So. Got it. Awesome. Well, here are the things I picked out. Um, the kind of underlying theme to most of the things you're saying is actually quite fundamental, and that's ensuring the customer data you have in Salesforce or whatever CRM is as accurate as possible, and that could feed up to allow sales ops to be much more strategic. Yes. Your kind of meta answer to our metric question about maybe it doesn't matter that much about what metric, but actually as long as you're comparing back over previous periods and then trying to understand what's going on with the with that metric um and then actually something you were saying in your answer to the virus related question and how you might be doing things differently is not saying not making changes to the team or changes that impact the team too early because if you keep doing that there's going to be all these changes then everyone's going to lose their minds right and so balancing it is almost like you you were saying that the ops team is in between leadership and the sales team in these challenging times and you're there to help almost smooth, like a big, trying to smooth the waves for them almost. Would you agree mm-hmm. with that? Yes, I think so. We're probably kind of the filter that when there are ideas coming from the leadership, then we're really kind of that cranking machine that helps figure out how do we make that work while also keeping the sales experience and impact in mind. Um, sometimes there are situations I think where ops, you know, based on priority and need, we're just asked to do something. Uh, and I have been in that situation at various organizations as well. But if you don't take the time to think through how do we make that work uh, f- with the intent that it is intended to for, let's say, sales and understanding the sales impact, a lot of times it's like the speed over quality kind of situation. Uh, it may be a minimum viable product, but let's make sure that we're actually thinking about the impact to sales and are we achieving what we, the leadership intended to deliver to sales. And I think that's a critical role that ops can play. Sure, Yuri. I think we could probably talk for another half an hour, but I'm going to have to cut it off there. Um, Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you.